they are related and will be in the book. So, a pretty ordinary kid. What I did possess by age seven was a precocious curiosity about the world and a genuine desire to travel. These set me apart and stirred my initial geotheistic zephyrs in my young brain. It was the fateful, I didn't know it was, it was the fateful month of August 1945 when I turned seven. <coughs> World War II had just ended. For some time, my parents had been planning a trip. Peace brought an end to gasoline rationing. It allowed rubber tires and other automobile parts back on the market. It opened tourist courts which had been shuttered tight. The nation's highways, though battered a bit, remained drivable. A family could hit the road. We Jordans did. My geotheism experienced its conception, though all things considered not a very immaculate one. The Nazis' human incinerators all over Central Europe still cooled from their grotesque activity. Nagasaki and Hiroshima dissipated a different radioactive warmth. Even the exceptional heat of the Texas summer lost a bit of its grip. Now remember, I was only seven. I can't recall paying any attention to the misfortunes of the Japanese or Europeans. Gaia herself sort of let that nuclear bomb thing slip right through her clay grip. My problem. No, I faced a greater and more immediate concern. One which, if badly handled, could have killed both my kind of geography and geotheism itself. My problem lay in the fact that my parents, who had chosen it as a destination, that nirvana of all true Texans, Colorado, <laughs> contemplated leaving me behind with my grandparents on a farm in the cotton fields and piney woods of East Texas. They imagined I was too young to appreciate such a journey. True, I had never crossed the border of Texas, nor had I ventured more than 250 miles from my home. But I really wanted to go on that trip. I used up all of the very small quota of whining and weeping allowed persons of my age in those times, with minimal and possibly even negative effect. I adopted another strategy. I had large ears figuratively, and listening to snippets of parental conversations and radio newscasts. I had accumulated some geo-facts, enough to pretend to be a pretty worldly little fellow. At the dinner table, our main conversation venue, I began popping questions. Hey, how come the Philippines belong to us when they're all the way across on the other side of the ocean? Well, this launched my parlor socialist father into a diatribe, completely incomprehensible to me at the time, against colonialism and the exploitation. But he did it in response to my question. Or, do the mountains in Colorado really reach three miles straight up? Wow, that must be a sight to see. Or, did you catch those pictures of Indians in the National Geographic? They were really interesting. Questions and remarks like that 
my parents silently began exchanging glances. They were evaluating the travel situation again. Still, they faced a major logistical and financial constraint. My father's teaching at SMU remained below the $3,200 a year he had made in 1932 when the school simply cut all wages in half instead of firing half the faculty. Two, our family automobile, which was a jet black four-door 1937 Dodge sedan, was going to be crowded if I came along. Due to the money problems, we've been obliged to invite an aunt and uncle, mercifully childless, to accompany us to Colorado, sharing expenses. My sister, 15, would come too. But to their everlasting credit, my parents relented. I would be allowed to go to Colorado. Had they not been so compassionate, or failed to see my exuberance, my kind of geography might never have come into existence. Today happens to be my mother's 96th birthday. Thanks, Mom. You're the one who really made that decision about going to Colorado. Now it's disappeared. I want the scrapbook that I said right there. I want to prove this. And now somebody else, well meaning, has removed all of the tabs from the book. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Right? Oh, wow. No, that's not it. Why do people do this to me? Here. <laughs> Baby book. Okay? <laughs> Pass it around. Two pictures. Sedan. Lots of people. <laughs> Get it right back to me because I have another one I want to show. And if she hadn't done that, then the world's first and only geotheistic church at University Park, Texas, would be still there. I would probably be plodding along as a Methodist, the denomination of my religiously lethargic redneck ancestors. <laughs> a fine church, to be sure, for many fine deeds, like destroying native cultures in the South Pacific Bible Belt. But in the final analysis, boring. I do love their music, though. <laughs> the natural. Some, perhaps even many people, certainly include me, are geographers by nature. Birth, DNA, instinct, inclination, whatever you want to call it. The discipline permeates our very bones. That doesn't mean you cannot be a good geographer if you lack these innate attributes. But I imagine you get on track later if you're made instead of born to it. We natural geographers possess, sometimes even by the age of seven, a built-in curiosity. Look at all those people. All in that one car. <laughs> a built-in curiosity about places, and regions, and natural habitats different from our own. We think territorially and spatially. That's how our biological species spread so rapidly across the earth to inhabit virtually every possible niche. That's why I so desperately wanted to go to Colorado or anywhere else that they might have chosen. I possess that curiosity. Heck, I would have gone to Iowa or Mississippi <laughs> happily. She could have been to Mississippi voluntarily three times just within the past year and a half. 